to be perfectly frank, as an art historian, I don't necessarily believe that art is essentially about beauty. It's about aesthetics, it's about the look of something, but not necessarily the beautiful. Um, I'm a great fan of Marcel Duchamp, who said that the more you look at something, everything is beautiful. And uh, some of his works about uh, or ordinary things that could be found in, say, a French restaurant, the bottle rack, for example. I'm a great fan of that work. Um, so, to me, along with Duchamp, that's more about ideas. It's about not how you see, but how you think. It changes the way you think. It's about, what he called it, brain facts. Yeah. And that's what art does. It makes you think. And um, so, I certainly am looking for something in the work of art that is challenging to your intellect, rather than just beauty by itself. You, you want a work of art to um, be eloquent and to say something about its context and about life. So that gives it a, a certain beauty. The works of art that last throughout the ages have a beauty that is uh, transcends time. Um, so they're not necessarily just about a momentary um, aspect that may, may be beautiful in a contemporary sense but without a lasting quality. There must be a universality. And um, I wondered about that, but when we had the short competition at the opening of the Art Prize, it was easy for the judges to agree because it was easy to, for them to see pieces that had those qualities of intellectual challenge as well as being lovely to look at. The new media are enormously enriching. You can diversify your concepts of what that was. It used to be sculpture was a three-dimensional piece made out of traditional m media materials. Um, paintings with oil painting on a, a canvas um, with a border that separated it away from the world. But now everything in the world can be art and everyone accepts that. And I think that's really exciting. I do think about social media and continual looking at images um, th this brings about a change in how we view art because back in the 14th century, 15th century, a work of art was something that you, or indeed, if you were a peasant in the fields, you would never see a work of art. You would never see a visual image at all unless you went to the church. Now, visual images are everywhere. There's a huge proliferation and you can't really take them all in. There are so many and they don't have that lasting quality. So, a work of art to be uh, a splendid work must last in some way, must have something that is eloquent to everybody. Um, so the proliferation on the one hand is great because uh, you get all this diversity of styles and media and it's exciting, but on the other hand there may be, and I'm not sure about this yet, I'm giving it some thought, but there may be a factor that discounts it and brings it down to a level, an image is just well, in the next second you'll see another one. Just have a clip a magazine and you'd see more images than a, someone in the 18th century would see in their whole life. So, um, that, whether that has a devaluing effect, I'm not sure. But at the moment I'm thrilled with the diversity and the excitement of making works of art in different media. Excellent. For any artist, the most important prize or an exhibition is a very big step because they put themselves on show, on display and available for a critical analysis. And this is very confronting. Um, Rudolf Pitkova wrote a book called Born Under Saturn, um, exploring whether artists have different characteristics from other people who are not artists. And maybe this is one of them because most people who are not artists don't put themselves um, at risk of critical analysis in the same kind of way for assessment, for judging if you like and so an art prize is all about judging and you have to be pretty courageous to do that I think um, so having made the decision to do it then there's a huge amount of work and of course it's competitive you're up against other people whose work is vastly different and somehow there has to be an assessment of which one is the best uh, it's very very difficult I think Um, 
Um, well, everyone chooses things differently, and yes, I have judged an art prize before, and it, you wonder about. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that the work that was selected was the right work, but it was a work by an indigenous artist. And I wondered about the context of the country town where the art prize took place, whether the, it was an inquisitive prize, it was going to hang in the council chambers, would they be happy? In the end, of course, I thought, well, you can't worry about that. This is the best work, this is the most dramatic piece, and this is the piece that was head and shoulders above the others. And so, um, in choosing a work for yourself, that's a different matter entirely, because you're just pleasing yourself. You, the more you know about the artist, the more you know about the context and the reasons behind the work, the more it, it will be able to speak to you. But you have to choose something that's going to last, that you're not going to be sick of within a week or a year and want to discard. So um, in the end it comes down to a, a, a choice that is personal, but for a prize it can't be so personal. It has to be a little bit broader than that. Um, Duchamp, to get back to, to him, he said he wanted to get rid of the aesthetics of personal choice. He wanted to get rid of taste. He didn't like that idea that taste would enter into it. It had to be something that would that, um, sustain itself without personal taste. It is hard, but I do have one, and it's a Burmese gnat, and a gnat is a spirit. The Burmese are animists, so they believe the spirits live in the trees, the spirits live in the natural world, and their spirits are female deities sometimes holding a conch shell. And I have one that is carved wood that I found just near the royal palace in Mandalay. There was a gallery out the back, and I'd seen them in the palace. When I saw this one in the gallery, I said to the gallery owner, surely that's not for sale. And he said, yes, it is. I was astonished. I didn't think they would sell it. So I said, oh, how much do you want? And they, he told me the price. And so I said, I would love to buy that. And I bought it. I look at it every day. When I turn off the light after breakfast, it's right there by the light. And I can see it, the little carved feet standing on the lotus leaf. Beautifully carved. The gentleness and tenderness in the face, the features, the delicacy of the carved clothing and the conch shell. It's really formidable. Anyway, after I'd bought it, of course, I wouldn't let anyone else pick it up or carry it because I didn't want it damaged. If it was going to be damaged, I'd have to do it myself. I wouldn't forgive either of them. Whoever helped me or the members of the family is quite big. So we wrapped it up carefully and I took it everywhere and always carried it in my arms. And when we got to the plane, same thing. And I put it under the, in the hold, carried it onto the plane and we opened the overhead locker and it fitted exactly. <laughs> Not a millimetre either side. It slipped in there exactly. And I knew it was perfect and it's been perfect ever since.